today we are going to solve surface area and volume problems with composite objects. Now, composite object, all that is, is two or more shapes that you know stuck together. And sometimes those shapes stuck, stuck together are easy, and then I think I put some on your review that are a little bit more complicated. Generally, volume questions with composite objects are the easiest. Because if you can figure out the different shapes that are present, figure out the volume of each of those shapes, you just have to add them together. Surface area gets a little bit more complicated because you have to think about what's not being covered and what is part of the outside surface. So surface area is a little bit harder than volume, but we start off with an easy one. This is a volume. We have a composite object, which is, what would we call that? What in real life has that shape? Maybe some buildings with a dome on top? Half of a pill, if it's broken in half? Hmm? Observatory. An observatory that could be an observatory, parliament. parliament building. So, okay. Like a pencil with an eraser. A pencil with an eraser that has not been sharpened yet. Okay. Right. Well, it's no, it's not pointy on this side. We could add a cone on the bottom, and then it would be perfectly a pencil. Okay. So we want to find the volume of this shape. Can you see that this one comes up with two shapes? One of them is a cylinder. The other one is a hemisphere or half a sphere. So when we're figuring that out, we pick, let's label them. I'm going to label this shape number one and this shape number two. We'll start with shape number one. It's half of a sphere. So our volume of a sphere formula, we write it out from our formula sheet, or maybe you just couldn't help yourself and have already got it memorized. Yes? No? Some people? Yeah? Okay. I mean, you don't have to memorize your formulas because you have a formula sheet, but the more fa formulas you memorize, the better because it's going to help you in a later math class. Some courses later on, like if you do go all the way to the advanced math calculus class, that class has no formula sheet. So you have to remember all the formulas you've learned and all the math that you've had all the way through. But the thing about formulas is the more you use them, the more you remember them, right? Like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Does anyone have that one memorized? Yes, almost all of you know, because you've used it often enough. So here we go. Volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed for our complete sphere. Do we know the radius? Yes. And then I'm going to just put it in green here afterwards. But we're going to need to divide it by 2, right? Because we only have a hemisphere. And maybe when writing this out, we even use words. And sometimes when you're showing your work mathematically, I know it's math, and math is numbers. But it's not bad to have little descriptors, even short, in words of what you're doing. Right? To help communicate best what we're doing. So I write, number one, hemisphere. That tells me, oh yeah. It's half. It might remind me that I need to divide my sphere formula by half and help me check my work later to see that it's clear. So I'm going to plug everything in. 4 thirds pi radius is 18. 18 cubed. And I still need to divide by 2 in the end. Can I type this all into my calculator at once? I sure can. 4 thirds, 4 divided by 3, pi radius 18 cubed power of 3 and then afterwards I need to divide by 2 1 2 2 2 1 4 point 5 I'm going to store this as the letter H for hemisphere Is it 0.5? Is that rounded correctly? Just double check. 
0.51, yes, that would be rounded correctly. Again, I'm going to keep all of my decimal places till the end. See, I can round it here in my work, that's fine, okay? But I want to keep all of my decimal places until the end. So that's why I stored it in my calculator as the letter H. Number two, a little bit of a word, we're now doing the cylinder, okay? Again, another reason those words are helpful is because sometimes you're doing math and your mind will wander off to something else and you haven't labeled things and you'll figure out the volume of the cylinder first and then you'll go to number two and you'll figure out the volume of the cylinder again because you know, like, your focus just lost for a second. So I'm like, oh, I did the hemisphere already. Now I'm going to do the cylinder. So my volume of my cylinder formula, that's your circle on the bottom times by the height. I don't have to put that dot in there, but I, I often do because I actually think of the circle and then multiplying it by the height afterwards. So it helps me remember the formula. Do we know everything on this one? Do we know the radius? Yes. 18. Do we know the height? Yes. 32. Can we type that in all at once? We can. Pi. 18 squared times by the height, which was 32. One thing I encourage you to do with your calculator is play around with things. Okay? Like I put the brackets in here exactly like my question. Okay? I like to play around with the calculator and say, would I have needed brackets on that 18 or not? And instead of putting brackets on the 32, could I multiply by 32? Does this give me the same answer or does it give me a different answer? If it gives me the same answer, what is the calculator doing? It's doing the same thing. Why? What's happening? Here with the brackets, it means pi times 18, 18 is squared, times 32. So here, I have pi times, because when nothing's written in between something, it'll mean multiply. So pi times 18 squared, notice the squared only squares the 18, it doesn't square the pi. And then I go times 32. This was a little bit shorter than before. I'm curious if I didn't even do that times. Would this work? It does. Feels a little bit funny. Okay? But getting to know your calculator is important and getting to know the operations of understanding how a calculator works is going to help you. Because sometimes you might get somebody else's calculator. And most calculators work similarly, but some are a little bit different. So you want to understand the tool that can help you. Because I don't want to multiply this out by hand, especially with the pi there. The 18 squared and the 32, maybe that's not so bad. Could do that. But you want to make sure that your calculator is giving the answers you want it to give you. 32, 52, 7. I'm going to store this one as C for my cylinder. Showing my work. Volume 32. Oh, man. Always forget the last couple numbers. 5, 7, 2. There we go. So the total volume will be the hemisphere plus the cylinder together. You could show your work if you wanted to by write, rewriting this number plus this number. I don't want to write all those numbers right now. I've stored one answer as H, one answer as C, so now I can go hemisphere plus cylinder. Whoops. Oops. On your calculator, you go to a screen you don't want to go to. Above the mode button is a quit button. So I put
push the second button and quit, and it brings me back to the main screen here. H plus C, 44786.5. Oh, man. Did I write it down correctly? 44787. Another thing I just did there, well, partially because my memory is, my memory is actually really good, but what happens sometimes is I start thinking about what am I going to do next two or three times, and then I forget what I'm doing right now. I don't know if you ever do that. But I started writing down the answer for my calculator, and I forgot what the last two numbers were. Okay? One thing that's a nice thing to get in the habit is after writing something down, Look back at your calculator and check. Because you will sometimes flip numbers. I do it all the time. I want to write 87, I think 7, and I write 78. Because both numbers are in my head, but the 7 is closest, so I write that number down first. So doing a quick check back to your calculator to make sure that you've written something down correctly, well, that's going to save you some marks here and there just from silly mistakes. Right? And those silly mistakes, everybody's made them. Everybody's got a quiz back where they're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. So how do we avoid those? Well, you're not going to avoid them. You're still going to make them. But how do you make them and then correct them is by doing little checks throughout. So here I just quickly check to make sure my calculator was right. And I'm also going to rely on you to check, because I will make some mistakes up on the board, and I'm expecting you to notice them when I do and say, uh, Mr. JR, isn't that supposed to be a 2? Like, yeah. Here, it's the nearest tenth of a cube. Oh, nearest tenth. Another thing we just did. Okay, At the end, I was going to check my units and check my rounding if it was correct. I needed to round to the nearest tenth. I haven't done that right here. I rounded to the nearest unit. To the nearest tenth would be 6.5. So again, I almost made one of those mistakes. But by rereading the question at the end, I helped see that, oh, I needed the nearest tenth. I need to have my units and its volume, so it'll be centimeters cubed. Little details are important. Little details can save you a lot of time later on. Because sometimes mistakes like this do this on a quiz, you make a mistake, what? You lose a half a mark. Big deal, right? But maybe there's something later on that you make a little mistake, you lose a lot more, right? You get the wrong time for a job interview. You show up 15 minutes late. How bad does that show on your job interview? Extremely, Extremely bad. Okay? Oh, man. No! <laughs> Here's our second example. Now we're going to look at surface area. Surface area is harder because you have some surfaces that no longer show up. If I counted the whole surface area of the cube on the bottom, I'm now missing the top of my cube. If I count the whole surface area of the pyramid on the top, I'm now missing the base. So we have two ways that you can go about solving this. Okay? One way is to figure out the total surface area and then subtract what's missing. So like if I figure out the total surface area of the cube, I'd have to take off one of the squares. Oh, gotcha. Okay? And if I calculate the whole surface area of the pyramid, I'd have to take off the base. So one way is to do it that way. And there will be some questions where that makes the most sense to do. Okay? There will be other questions where, and I think this falls into one of those, is where it's just easier to imagine what are all the shapes on the sides and the top and the bottom and add them all up. Okay? So in this case, can you see that the surface area would be five squares and four triangles. Yes? I mean, normally the 
cube has six sides, but we don't have the top. Normally, a pyramid has a base, but we don't have that either. So if we use that strategy, we would say, and I'll write it out in words right now, but this one only has two shapes. Sometimes your surface area is going to have a lot more shapes. But in this case, it's only two shapes. Five of those squares and four of those triangles. Let's label things that we know. What do we know about the square? One side is five. One side is five. The other sides we don't know. Hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a square. There are going to be five. Good. What do we know about the triangle? The height is four. The height is four. And the base is five because it's the same side as the square. So our area of our square is going to be base, or side times side, or 5 times 5, which is 25. The area of our triangle is base times height divided by 2. Are you OK if I do that all mental math? Just write 10. Right, 5 times 4 divided by 2. Good. So my total surface area is 5 of those squares plus 4 of those triangles. 125 plus 40, 165 meters. We're doing surface area, so it'll be meters squared. I'm going to leave you the last question for yourself, and I'm going to create in the blank page, we're going to add a different question. So this one, you can do on your own. Can you see that the surface area of this one is a little bit more difficult because we have one, two, three, four, five rectangles, but some of them are different sizes. Okay. We have two that are four by five, two that are six by five, and one that's six by four. So that makes it a little bit harder. Then we have another two rectangles on the roof and two triangles. So this one has more shapes to do, but I would do this in the same technique that we did this one where we just add up all the outside shapes that we have to figure out the total surface area. But I wanted to show you one where the other strategy might be better. So we're going to take a rectangular prism here. Uh, let's make this a square and that longer. And on top of this rectangular prism, we're going to put a cylinder with a radius of 1 okay, and a height of 5. Okay. This is what you made as a diagram of a factory for your geography class. We're going to add some units just for fun. We'll say this was made in kilometers. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> nice. The biggest model ever submitted for a homework assignment ever. I don't know how you brought it to <laughs> how you brought it to school. Yeah, you bought you went outside of Winnipeg just for this assignment, bought a piece of land, 
constructed this out of aluminum, which is expensive, and said, here is my final project. <laughs> and you were disappointed when you got 7 out of 20. <laughs> we are going to find the surface area. And I do this one because this is one where the second strategy makes more sense. Instead of doing all of the sides separately, we're going to figure out total surface area and subtract things that are missing. Because part of the problem, if you took this seven kilometer shape and you built a big bucket and filled it full of paint so you could dip it in and take it out, okay? Can you see that on this top part, if you took it apart, there would have been a hole here that didn't get painted with, and you happened to decide to paint it green. So when you dipped it in green paint, everything was, when you took it apart, there's a hole missing that didn't get painted in green. Because that's where the cylinder was sitting on top. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do as a strategy is we're going to find the surface area of our prism entirely, find the surface area of our cylinder entirely, and then take those two things apart and see what didn't get painted. Imagine dipping it in paint, letting it dry, putting it back on your big piece of land that you bought, okay? And then breaking those things apart and seeing what didn't get painted. So let's start with the, let's write it out here. Let's start with the prism. Number one, I'll label that number one here. Can you see that your prism consists of two squares that are three by three and four rectangles that are three by seven. So again, I drew some pictures to demonstrate each of those separate parts. Here the area would be 9. Here the area would be 21. So my surface area of my prism is going to equal 2 of those ones at 9 plus 4 of the ones at 21. 18 plus 84. Is that 102? Uh, yes. We'll round to the nearest kilometer. <laughs> if it doesn't say, so if I made a question like this and I didn't say what unit, that gives you the option. You can round to whatever you would like to. Okay, generally I would do one or two decimal places just to show that you're accurate. Yes, Maya? Um, if you didn't put the unit, would you just want us to do like unit or whatever? Yeah, if I didn't put the unit, then you would, you would not get dot marks for not writing units squared. But if you like to practice always including your units, I would say write units squared or units cubed at the end just so that you're forcing yourself to check all the time. And that's a good practice. Okay, so we've got the surface area of our prism, which is 102. Number two, we are going to do the cylinder. So I'm going to write the word cylinder here. Again, I'm keeping my work nice and organized. What's the surface area of my cylinder? Well, surface area of a cylinder is two circles and one rectangle. Right? But we also have on our formula sheet the formula for surface area of a cylinder, and it's written as 2 circles, 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. Remember that that rectangle is the circumference times the height. So maybe you don't remember how to figure out the circles and the rectangles, but you're like, oh, I have that formula. So I plug in the formula. And plugging everything into the formula, we know the radius is 1. And we know that the height is 5. Yes? We'll talk about that in a second. Yes. 
Okay, but we're going to figure, the plan for this one is to figure out each surface area separately and then think about what we need to subtract. Okay? Okay, I'm going to do something here and I want you to think about how I did that. Okay, I'm going to put this into my calculator. Watch my calculator. What did I do to get 37.7? Why is that the right answer? I wrote 12 pi for all of that. What did I do? You could type the whole thing in if you wanted to. You'll get the same answer. Yes? I did mental math, but how do you I multiply it? So this this all multiplied out is the same as well, no, just this part. This part would be two pi. Does that make sense? And here I have two times one times five. That's ten. This part is ten pi, and two pi plus ten pi. Those are like terms. We could add them together. Could be twelve pi. Okay. Again, sometimes even though you have a calculator. That mental math doesn't take very long, okay? And it saved me time typing something into my calculator that would have been longer to type in. All right, but you do have the possibility of making an error. So now we're going to figure out, we figured out each part separately. We're going to figure out the total surface area going to be the total surface area of my rect of my prism which is 102 plus the surface area of my cylinder which is 37.7 but this is where if you do each one in total we think about dipping it in the green paint taking it out letting it dry and breaking the things apart can you see on the cylinder there would be a circle missing can you see on your rectangle, there's also a circle missing. So what we have to do is, this is if everything is painted, we now have to subtract two circles, which will be subtracting 2 times pi. So I've got, on my calculator, 102 plus, I don't want to round yet, I want to use this answer, so I can go second answer, minus 2 pi r squared, which simplifies to just be 2 pi, 133.4, we said we'd round to the nearest kilometer, <laughs> this is surface area, oh my goodness. If you were painting this by hand, it might take you a couple of years. <laughs> Think about how long a kilometer is. Think about going a kilometer and making a square with a kilometer, and you need 133 of those to paint to finish everything up. So right now, if you've got your textbooks, you can work on the homework assignment. If you don't have your textbook here, I would suggest start with this one and get an answer for that one.